said thank you, Alessia and Marta, for inviting me to this. The issue of the rise of China is occupying the American uh, political imagination and strategists and the business community a great deal. Whether the rise of China is a threat to the interests of the United States or whether it need not be a threat and we should accommodate to the rise of China. Um, to some extent, that debate is sharpened here by two things. One is that, um, that we take a lot of credit for the rise of China. Now, that may seem uh, either blindingly obvious or terribly controversial, but you know, when Nixon visited China and launched the policy of engagement, as we call it, he uh, articulated a strategy of bringing China into the world of nations and the idea that the prosperity and stability of China were in the interests of the United States. So at that time, China was, we viewed, and I think correctly, the US viewed China as a revolutionary power that threatened the order, the international order, and Nixon's idea was we will engage the Chinese, we will um, entice them with the material benefits of being part of the world order that the United States dominated and they will get rich and they will become pro-stability and all that happened. Uh, China became rich and, uh, and I think China has joined, you know, the World Trade Organization as participates actively in the UN, it participates in the six party talks. It doesn't line up 100% with the United States on most issues, neither do most of our other allies. For example, France line up 100% with the United States, but China has definitely joined the international system economically and politically and diplomatically in a, a large way. So engagement worked, it was successful in this regard, but as Alessia mentioned, it hasn't led so far to China becoming a democracy. And part of the American strategic vision of the world is that uh, the US is more secure when other major countries are democracies. We have a substantial democracy promotion uh, industry in Washington, DC. I myself am a member of the board of an organization called the National Endowment for Democracy, which spends over $100 million each year promoting uh, that the Congress appropriates uh, to uh, promote democracy in various countries, including China. So the failure of China to democratize uh, is a big disappointment, strategic disappointment so far for the United States. And also the sort of second stage of its prosperity when it was becoming prosperous and was uh, uh, settling down and joining international regimes and joining the copyright, you know, intellectual property right regime and passing laws that American lawyers said they needed to pass in order to allow Western investment and so on. That was China coming into alignment with American wishes and American systems. But now that its wealth is continuing to increase so massively, the question arises whether its strategic ambitions will also increase and it will challenge the US. So, so this, uh, uh, the rise of China not quite being what uh, American strategy had envisioned, going beyond it in some respects economically and not coming all the way up to the vision politically. And then this has intersected with the, the, the recent last decade or so of China's very dramatic rise has intersected with the uh, deterioration of this post-Cold War vision of the United States as the sole superpower. And George W. Bush published in 2002 a paper called The National S Security Strategy of the United States, which said that it is the security strategy of the United States to dissuade any other power from even trying uh, to develop a status as a peer competitor of the United States. I mean, it's hard to, uh, if you 
don't already know that this document was published in 2002, it may seem incredible now in 2011 to realize that it was published at that time, but the idea was we will be so massively powerful that any other country, China, Russia, looking at us will just say it isn't worth competing. Well, that sense of uh, overweening power has gradually dissipated in the United States for many reasons that you know, so that we now have a robust uh, debate going on here about declinism, whether the United States is in decline. So the rise of China intersects with a moment in the American consciousness where we're thinking about ourselves as in decline, which has been really, I think, sharply exacerbated by the partisan gridlock in Washington, the, pro the view of uh, the Republicans in the House stymieing every policy initiative by the president and the president not being able so far to find a way and not seeming to adopt a strong posture either toward this ha has, has exacerbated the American sense of decline. So with respect to China, it's given rise to this debate and I reviewed, I, I guess, have you read the things that were, that you think they've read those things that we handed out, but I submitted for you to look at a book review that I wrote of the Friedberg and Kissinger reviews, where there, the Friedberg is a very good statement of the China threat perspective and the Kissinger one is a, um, in a sort of confusing really, but st in the end of the day, I think uh, uh, influential if not clearly written statement for uh, an accommodationist posture toward China that the rise of China is something we have to accept and come to terms with and Friedberg suggests we have to find some way to more strongly resist it. So this is an active debate. It's, it's, it plays out in Washington, for example, now in the uh, struggle over this currency bill that's going through the Senate or maybe past the Senate. I'm not sure if it has yet passed it, which is a bill to set up a mechanism in theory to sanction China if it doesn't uh, lower the value of its currency fast enough for the United States. So th there's been also a debate in Washington over the president's approved arms sales package to Taiwan. The president approved the sale of some uh, packages to modify Taiwan's F-16 fighter aircraft, but he did not make a decision so far, anyway, to sell them new models of the F-16. So he's been attacked by some people in Congress and elsewhere in Washington for being afraid to uh, provoke the Chinese by selling Taiwan the weapons that we ought to sell them. So th the in, this, in the policy making circle as well. So the, the debates over the Taiwan arms sale and over the currency issue are sort of public political manifestations of the China debate. They're dramatized, they're, they're, they're uh, political show. But in the private policy making circles in Washington, there also is a lot of debate over strategy issues toward China, um, how to counter Chinese aggressive naval patrolling in the South China Sea, what, uh, uh, w what posture to take on Taiwan, arms sales packages to Taiwan, how the U.S. should defend or what role it should play in the territorial dispute between China and Japan. So in many places in the American political system, also in the media, this issue of China's being vetted and debated, although not yet in a big way in the presidential campaign. Because right now we have the, Repub the whole presidential campaign as the Republican primary. And the, for the Republicans, the China issue, well, there was an article in yesterday or today or New York Times saying so far foreign policy has not really played a role in the Republican primary campaign. But when we get to the real 
campaign where Obama will be the Democratic candidate. It's, I can't be sure, but I w wouldn't be surprised if the issue of China came up with the Republican candidate attacking Obama for being soft on China and being intimidated by China and so on. So I want to, uh, so that's a little briefing on the China issue as it stands now in the American political debate. And I want to say something, because uh, I'm chiefly a China specialist, I often tell people, people will say, what do you do? I say, I'm a political scientist. And they say, well, what, who's going to win the election campaign? I say, I don't understand. American politics is too complicated for me. I only understand something simple like Chinese politics. So I want to talk uh, a little bit about how I actually see the rise of China. And I t teach a course on Chinese foreign policy, so I talk about it from a Chinese point of view. I try to develop for the students an understanding of the drivers of Chinese policy making. We see the policies happening. We see the, how they vote in the UN. We see their, uh, I understand this morning, you heard from Dan Rosen, we see their uh, investments in the US and in Latin America, Africa, and around the world and in Europe. Um, we see their arms build up, but what is driving these policies? And I developed two main points in the course that I want to share with you that have a common theme about China's so far, up until the present at least, relative vulnerability in the international system. So we see China as this very, very strong um, expanding power and those facts are there but I want to bring in the two big elements of vulnerability in the Chinese security situation as they see it, and I think they see it accurately in large part. The first one is geostrategic. That is to say where China is on the map, the neighborhood that it's in, the setup of China itself. So China's, of course, as you know, I don't need a PowerPoint to make this point, big country with a very large population. And I'm sure you also know, but you may not dwell on this point as much as somebody like me would do because I study it, that a large part of this Chinese territory is controlled insecurely by the regime in Beijing. It's very different from France or the United States or other countries that we're familiar with where the government's control over the people and the territory is essentially uncontested. In China, that's not the case. Uh, most, 94% of the population consists of these ethnic, what they're called Han, H-A-N, in other words, the Chinese people that we think of as Chinese, who live chiefly along the coast on a sort of 600 mile band along the coast, the huge cities, Shanghai, you know, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, and all down to Guangzhou. And those populations are in the midst of tremendous social stress as a result of very fast economic growth, very fast migration from the countryside into the cities, very fast social and cultural change. And as a result, uh, their demands are constantly rising. There are many, many, uh, demonstrations, many issues over land seizure, over pollution, over corruption, so that the regime's control over the society is always on a kind of tightrope, and the government is very nervous about that and uses many methods to control it, propaganda, paying off dissatisfied groups, and a very heavy police presence, internet police, political police, and so on. So that right there, they're much more insecure. When we have demonstrations on Wall Street or you know, Tea Party demonstrations in Washington, it really doesn't threaten the survival of the regime in the United States. And in China, the regime believes that its survival is on the line because of social change. And I think that, that, that it is true that the re regime's survival is on the line and it could collapse. Then 
the huge amount of Chinese territory, Xinjiang, this huge province in the northwest, Tibet, this huge area also in the west, which includes not only the Tibetan autonomous region that we see on the map, but areas around that that are populated also by Tibetan, ethnic Tibetan people, um, are the, the uh, dominant populations in these areas are really not loyal to the People's Republic of China. They are very dissatisfied. Um, they really don't have a military or political capability to break away and establish independence, but they are dissatisfied. Occasionally, outbreaks of disorders in these regions. And each of those areas has helpers outside of China. There are Uyghurs, that's the Xinjiang people living in Central Asia, living in Germany, living in Turkey, in Washington, DC. There are Tibetans in India. There's a Tibetan over, you know, Tibet, I think the Tibet movement, the Dalai Lama is very popular in France. He's popular in the United States. Sarkozy met with the Dalai Lama. Uh, this presents a threat to the Chinese control of their own territory. It's chiefly Tibet and Xinjiang, but the Mongol people, ethnic people in a part of China, Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region, also are dissatisfied. And Taiwan, which from the Chinese point of view is a very key security bastion that they must control is not under their control and shows no near term sign of coming under control. Hong Kong, which is a you know, fairly secure place, is nonetheless a place which is difficult for Peking, Beijing to completely control because of the arrangement there where it has its own system and it has a free press and so on. So just within the borders of China as the Chinese see it, I, including Taiwan, they have tremendous security issues that are not faced by most other modern states in the international system. Maybe Russia has that kind of problem. And then the bordering countries around China are present a, a long menu of difficult security issues for them. You have Russia, which is a huge country that has always been very suspicious and paranoid about China. You have Japan, which is a very, very powerful country. I think we tend to underestimate the power of the Japanese military and its technological sophistication, which is very suspicious of China. Korea, which uh, you know, is a large country, 80 million people, the two Koreas together with a very large army that wants to be independent of any outside force. Vietnam, which is a country that doesn't like the Chinese. India, which is a country that doesn't like the Chinese. And, you're and big countries that don't like China. Now, if today we say, well, those problems are not severe because China and Russia are allies, and China and North Korea are allies, and China and South Korea have tremendous trade, and China has huge investments in Vietnam, and Chinese trade with India is growing. All those things are true, but they are not natural geostrategic facts. These are the result of, in various ways, of Beijing's policy efforts. And there's a fragility to all of those relationships because the geostrategic reality is one of jealousy. And again, a country like the United States doesn't face that. You know, our neighbors are Canada and Mexico. They are not countries on a scale to threaten us or with a uh, geostrategic reason to threaten us. France is in the EU. I mean, it used to, France used to be in a, in a situation in which it was surrounded by similar enemies, but after World War II, after the creation of the EU, after the development of European civilization, after all of these circumstances, you have a situation in which war with France's immediate neighbors is truly unthinkable. China is not in that situation. Uh, we, we could spend a long, long time trying to compare why. And it's not necessarily impossible that in 100 years from now, there could be something like an Asian security community. But those conditions are far from ripe at the present time. And then 
looking beyond the borders, uh, the region around China, which is a large region, out to Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, and so forth, China finds itself um, certainly as a major power today, but not as a power that can really defend with military means or political influence its interests in these farther regions. China has increasing dependency on this farther ring of the world, the parts of the world farther that are beyond its immediate periphery. It has increasing stakes in those areas. It depends on them for oil, for copper, for iron, for soybeans, for profits, for markets. Uh, and yet uh, it really doesn't have an, a military or, or a dominating political capability to defend those interests in the way that the United States has. And I think that uh, the European powers have in a selective way. So France has the capability um, you know, to mount force against Libya along with uh, Britain and the United States. And France has the capability to go into other parts of Africa if it needs to do so. The Western powers jointly have the capability to dominate the Middle East still and to, if necessary, protect our oil supplies there in the US. Now, we're not doing that every day of the week, but that capability is part of the picture, and China doesn't have it. So the, my first point about China, then, is that it has a very deep geostrategic insecurity that is rooted in geography. And the second point is that it has designed a strategy to get out of that insecurity that depends upon interdependence. It is no longer an autarkic economy, as you people know very, very well, better than I do. Uh, the strategy of developing security through autarky basically failed under Mao, and Deng Xiaoping embarked on a strategy of achieving security through interdependence. And that interdependence is very, very deep and constraining for China. We all live, all of the wealthy countries in the world live in a world of interdependence. India does, certainly all the European countries do, and the United States does. But um, the, the ways in which that interdependence constrains different countries is probably different, it varies. But it, it is very constraining on all of them. And I think the primary point I want to make is not the difference in how interdependence constrains wealthy countries, but the fact that it constrains China a great deal. Um, I was recently talking to one of my Chinese friends who's an expert on such things. And we were talking about the renminbi, the Chinese currency, the Chinese dollar, the yuan which is such a big issue in Washington. And he was um, telling me the following things that I think are kind of illustrative of interdependence. In, in 2005, which is very recently, the Chinese government made a decision to unpeg, gradually unpeg the renminbi, the yuan, from the dollar. It had been fixed by the government. They made that decision for several reasons. One was that it was a WTO obligation. They had entered the WTO, excuse me, <clears throat> in 2001 and put off this decision until they felt that they needed to do it. A second reason was that they were in a relatively strong economic position so they could start doing it. A third reason was that it is a long-term strategy of the Chinese government, and this is very public, to make the yuan eventually into an international reserve currency and enjoy all the many benefits that come from that. And that requires a gradual process of unpegging it and putting it into the free market. And the fourth reason that they did it was to, uh, as part of a strategy to develop domestic demand. They knew that they needed to develop domestic demand as a driver for economic growth which is the same thing that's argued by the pundits in Washington. The Chinese know that, and they agree. But it's a question of the t how long it takes to make that tr tr transition. That will give them more security. It will also 
give in terms of uh, of not dependent, not being as dependent on foreign markets to drive economic growth, and by pr raising the living standards of the people. So they began to unpeg the yuan, and it was at first 8.27. It's now gone to 6.36. That is 6.36 yuan to the U.S. dollar, which, from a Chinese point of view, is fairly rapid, you know, change. When you're steering a ship, you know, 1.3 billion people and all these changes have an impact on domestic prices and on the whole domestic economy and jobs. And they're moving at the pace that they can move to about 450 to 5 yuan per dollar. And that's the target, but it will take quite a bit of time. And he pointed out to me that the recent, so this is interesting, the recent economic crisis in the Eurozone you, you guys probably know all this because you're in the business world, but this came as a, uh, an interesting insight to me, has driven up the value of the dollar. People are fleeing to the dollar. As people flee to the dollar, the Chinese have difficulty holding the, the dollar strengthens and it's hard for the Chinese to maintain the current 6.36 exchange rate it tends to uh, revalue to go higher than 6.36, which is the wrong direction for them. And so they're fighting very hard right now to keep it from increasing in value. While in Washington, in the Senate, they're being attacked for not decreasing, revaluing the value of the renminbi faster than they are. So this is a maybe small, but I mean currently very uh, timely example of this interdependence of the global markets that the Chinese policymakers have to deal with. And of course, they're inter interdependent in so many uh, other ways. So I present this to my class about these two big facts of Chinese foreign policy. Now, the, uh, what does that mean for the China threat, you know, the Kissinger-Friedberg debate? And on that, I like to divide it up into two parts, now and the future. Because you know, we, all, we don't know the future, so we have to separate that out and make it a subject of speculation. But we, all we know is now. And I think what we can say about now is that now the Chinese ri rise of China has not yet presented what I would call a threat. Now, it depends on your definition of the word threat. Certainly, the rise of China or any d development in the international system is a mix of maybe not any development, but most developments in the international system present somebody like the United States or any other actor with a mix of benefit and loss. But it seems to me that up until today, or as of today, that the ch rise of China has presented more benefit than loss to the US. This is a US-centered analysis, but you can make the same analysis probably for Europe. So yes, the Chinese are buying up properties in the U.S. They're causing adjustment in the U.S. job market. They're uh, acquiring commodities around the world and so on. But economically, there are so many ways in which the rise of China has benefited the U.S., the way in which they've provided low, you know, raised our standard of living by providing low-cost, high-quality consumer products, their investments here are good for our economy, their purchase of treasury bonds is good for our economy. Uh, many of the things that they do are good for our, our economy and we are interdependent with them in that way. Militarily, I think that we are um, far from being threatened at this point by China. We have the US rings China with bases. We have bases in Korea, Japan, we have a military relationship, not bases, with Taiwan. We have military cooperation with the Philippines, with Vietnam, with Singapore, with Indonesia. We have military cooperation with, uh, with India. We have bases in Afghanistan. We have bases in some Central Asian countries. They are surrounded by our military forces. It's true that the Chinese have acquired certain capabilities that make would make it harder for the U.S. military in any pitched battle that might break out, which conceivably could break out over, I don't expect it to be, but conceivably over the issue of Taiwan. 
but I think the U.S. at this point remains far in advance of Chinese technology uh, in terms of soft power, you know, the charm of the American idea versus the charm of the Chinese idea. And I gave you this review that I wrote of Martin Jakes's book, When China Rules the World. I just think he's exaggerating tremendously the ability of China to, to win, to influence people around the world by the, the, its vision for what it stands for. Certainly the U.S. brand is profoundly tarnished. I acknowledge that, but um, <clears throat> the Chinese brand, I think, is quite weak. The Nobel Peace Prize to Liu Xiaobo and how China responded to that were just a crystallization of how weak the Chinese brand is. So in general, I think right now it's really much too early to say that China threatens us today. But what about the future? And this is my concluding thing because I, I want you to have a chance to uh, raise comments and questions and uh, redirect me maybe toward issues that may concern you more if I haven't addressed those issues yet. What about the future? Could the continued rise of China then become a threat to the United States? Which is really what the debate is about. That's what Friedberg is talking about and it's what Kissinger is talking about. Nobody, I think, and, and what uh, uh, Martin Jakes is really talking about is the future. So I, of course, I say it depends. And it depends on two big things. One is what happens in China and the other thing is what happens in the United States. And both of those are very much open to debate and very hard to forecast. So with respect to what might happen in China, I think there's a widespread view among China analysts that the current Chinese trajectory is very fragile. And I think that many, not all, but many Chinese feel that way as well. This goes back to what I was saying before about the insecurity, political insecurity of the regime at home. It's not a regime that feels very stable to to me or I think to Chinese people that I talk to and I think to the regime itself, I think they feel that they have to work very hard to stay in power, that if there's bad inflation, if there's a collapse of the job market in China, if people's living standards don't continue to improve in China at a rapid pace or if they are humiliated in some international conflict, that the regime is open to question. It's a sharp contrast with a country like Japan, where the regime has performed very badly for 30 or so years, but there's no movement in Japan really that says, let's throw out the, two, the party system, let's throw out the constitution, let's bring back the military, let's bring back the fascists or something. The, there's, but in China, there is a constant debate over What's the alternative to one party rule? Uh, there's a pro-democracy <coughs> movement within the party itself. There are people talking about the need for political reform of the system, how, how thorough a reform is never really made clear. So there's this, always this idea that the current Chinese political system is in a transition to something and that it's open to question. That's not found in stable regimes. Um, as well, the economic model in China seems to be fragile. This rapid rate of growth, the, 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 the danger of overheating, the danger that foreign markets will uh, not be able to continue to absorb uh, the, the, the Chinese growth model, the environmental damage that is being done by the Chinese growth model, the natural slowdown of growth that any economy goes through as it matures the need to shift as cost of labor increases into higher value added products and the question about whether the Chinese economy can really support innovation and all these things. So there's so much questioning about that also. So it seems like the Chinese economy may slow down, the system may encounter some kind of a political crisis. Um, any of those kinds of scenarios could answer our question about the Chinese threat by setting back this 
threat, slowing the rate of growth, damaging the sort of strategic focus that the Chinese leadership has been able to sustain in the last 20 or so, more 30 years, uh, could even produce a different kind of Chinese threat if, I'm not saying this is likely, but if the Chinese system really entered a deep crisis and, and began to in some way collapse. There was a book published about 10 years ago called The Coming Collapse of China. What the collapse of China would look like is uh, there are so many forms that it could take. We don't have time to discuss it, but if it was something like that, it would be, that would actually be bad for the outside world because of the vastness of, of, of this political system. So, so the idea that China in the future would become a threat partly depends on the internal trajectory of China, which is very questionable. And then the second thing that it depends on, I think, is really the, the West and, and whether we uh, collapse or decline. And, um, and also upon the policies that we adopt toward China. So I always uh, tell people the best China policy for the United States is a good US policy. We should fix our problems. That's why I support these kids on Wall Street. I don't know what they want to do, but I know they want to fix the problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we got to uh, fix our economy. I mean, I know none of this is easy, but this is what we need to do, continue the vitality of, of the US. And the same thing for Europe, and continued vitality of the US-European alliance, which I think, you know, I don't see a threat to that either, uh, it's, but th it's very important. And, and I think that if the US keeps its lead, and I have, uh, I, I am not one of those people who believes in sort of historical inevitability that what goes up must come down and since the US has been in the lead, it must decline. I think the US has every realistic possibility of continuing to be a leader in innovation and in, in, in economic growth and in military technology and so on, even though it's a moving target. So if we can fix the US and not jump to the conclusion that China, well, so that's the first thing. And then I think the wise handling of China is the second requirement for US policy, which uh, is not something I can summarize in a word, you know, like to handle China, we have to do a Pacific community, like Kissinger said. I don't think there's any one model, but I think all the issues having to do with China, whether it's the South China Sea, all the issues where the US and China interests uh, come into friction. I don't want to say conflict, but I think friction. Whether it's the uh, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, which is a very uh, current and sharp issue of friction, or whether it's the value of the, the renminbi dollar exchange rate or whether it's Chinese trade policy so on, or Chinese human rights policy, that the US needs to find the right balance where we draw the, uh, where we uh, firmly uh, articulate and work for our interests. And I, on each of these issues, I have my own opinion about what those fundamental American interests are, while not panicking and threatening the Chinese interests, which I tried to explain you know, what I think that they are. And I believe that fundamentally American and Chinese security interests are, in theory, compatible. They, they don't represent an inevitable conflict. And the main reason for that is China's over there and we're over here. Our security interests have to do with our region. They extend to the area around China, but the stability of Japan, the stability of Korea, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea actually are in the interests of both China and the United States. Prosperity, 
is in the interests of both China and the United States and so on. So at a, at a high level of generality, I think the two countries' interests are compatible. But to navigate through the adjustment of all those interests without creating a conflict requires skill, which I hope states persons on both sides will demonstrate. And so far, I actually think they have done that. So I, the bottom line is I don't see an inevitable conflict. And I use the word conflict in a strict sense, a real conflict, military, between China and the United States coming from the rise of China, partly because China's rise may not, can, probably won't continue on this sharp trajectory, and partly because the U.S. Not, need not decline and partly because the two sides can work their way through to finding the common interests that they have. Now, the point of view that I am expressing, my analysis, I think is not very popular in the U.S. political system, partly because it's too complicated you know, and academic. But I think it's pretty... Uh, consistent with the views of the professional policy makers in the, in, in the government in the United States. And, actually, and, and, and so who, who, who don't play the political game. So the political game in the United States is very loud and very simplified and uh, has, is, can be important. But there's a quiet substratum of professional policy making, which tends to be more uh, stable, more balanced. It doesn't mean that we're completely safe in anybody's hands. But, um, but I think uh, what I'm saying may sound unfamiliar, but I think it's not that I influence the people in Washington. Maybe they influence me more. But I think those who deal with uh, China as, as a focus of interest would uh, often come to a similar something similar to, not exactly, but something similar to my point of view. So you may see Ch American China policy under the surface. So for example, with the uh, hewing to this type of line, for example, with the currency issue, while it's being debated so loudly in Washington, the, the finance professionals on both sides are actually managing it, I think, with understanding of one another's constraints even though they have to answer their political people as well. Okay, so let me stop there.